There we go. It's nine o'clock. Thanks everyone for coming. I have a couple questions to sort of gauge the room. How many of you, this is your first conference since COVID? Are any of you nervous about being here like I am? Just me. <laughs> I haven't given a talk in like three years, so I'm a little rattled, but everything should be fine. Uh, my name is Sean Wildermuth. Uh, I'm a uh, Pluralsight author, speaker, all that other stuff. I have a title page here, but I'm not going to belabor it. Um, I want to talk about Tailwind, and how many of you have used Tailwind already? One. Okay, that's the right audience. You're going to have to check to make sure everything I say is, is right. So that's your job, right? Okay. Um, and how many of you enjoy doing CSS? That's also the right audience for this. So the big thing I want to sort of start with is this idea of what is Tailwind CSS. Because when I first ran into Tailwind CSS, my initial reaction was, this is another bootstrap. This is another thing that will make my website look like every other website out on the web, right? The, what I used to call the bootstrapification of the web, right? Everyone had the same title bar and drop downs and all that. And as I dug into it, it is a bit different. One, it's a pure CSS framework. There's no JavaScript that's running in the background. It doesn't have components in that same way. It's really for styling your classes in the way you want to with some um, customization, but also uh, a consistency that you don't really get by writing your own CSS. It typically uh, produces a really tiny version of the CSS in production, which is one of the things I really liked about it. And there is a build, uh, a dev, um, a development time build process as part of it. Because one of the things it's doing, and we'll see in a minute, is it's building the CSS as you're doing development and making that CSS bigger as you, you utilize more of these utility classes. So I'm a, does anyone want to see a bunch more slides? Because this is the only other slide that matters. Um, so we're going to get into code. Let me start with the, the project and we're going to, Spend a lot of time just making this project. I have a little um, website, if I could get rid of the, there we go. A little website that just allows me to look at some API I made, I made up. And uh, so far, you know, it looks okay, it's not great. Um, and the way I've developed it isn't with Tailwind. Does everyone see that text large enough or should I make it larger for people in the back? Good? Good. I'll take silence. And what I've done to create that is I actually just have a whole, all hand-coded CSS, like I've done for the last 15 or 20 years, right? I've just gone in and written all this by hand. Um, and I, uh, I could have done this, in fact, I think, I can't remember if I'm using SCSS in here or not, no. Could have done this with SAS or LESS or one of the other libraries. And so we're going to sort of start from scratch and just ignore that um, CSS entirely. We're going to go to the index.html, and I'm going to do the thing no one likes to see, get rid of the CSS, right? And our lovely site turns into that. Let me see if I'm connected to the internet. I forgot about the... Sorry about that. I knew I was going to forget connecting one of these things. Come on. You go clockwise to make the connection speed up. I don't know if you're aware of that. Just don't go counterclockwise. Really? Okay. Had to, um, so this is the same website I had a moment ago, but there's no CSS associated with it, right? This is just pure HTML. There's really a mess that I need to kind of figure out how to work with. And so I'm going to start by just adding CSS, uh, Tailwind from a CDN. Now, if you want to sort of play, whoops. If you want to sort of play with, why does it keep it opening up that? Uh, there is a Tailwind. CDN. It's almost like I'm jet lagged. 
that you can sort of get started, but this is not what you want to use in your project. It's missing a number of features that you might utilize, and it's also using JavaScript to sort of figure out what scripts to use. So it's, it's a pretty inefficient one, but it's to enable us to get started before we get into actually how Tailwind works. And so with Tailwind installed, it's changed a tiny bit, maybe hard to see, but none of the elements have any styles. It's doing a complete reset to the style. So the drop-down box there doesn't have any borders or margins or anything. H1s aren't any bigger than any, any other text. It's doing a complete reset. And so let's just start using it. So I have a, nope, I have a site name here. And I have been using CSS classes for the ID, but the idea behind uh, Tailwind is really to say, uh, I want to be able to style this from scratch, and I'm going to just use classes. So first of all, I can say um, text to Excel. So there's sizes of text from extra small up to 5x. So you can kind of decide how large the text need to be. This is where a second screen would come in to help. To Excel. Why don't you like that? Bold and base. And there are a number of these utility classes. You can see that each one is really defining some property of the thing we want to see. So we can now see the Bechdel test is now larger in fonts, I mean in bold. And later on, we'll see that it's not going to wrap as we start to redevelop our, product, uh, our, our website. And so the way we've, I've structured this specific site is I have a header, a main section, and then a footer. And we're going to uh, start to use those at first to sort of structure um, the site. And so let's start up here with a class that says background amber. And each of the colors that are built in, and you can customize these colors, uh, have a range of 50 to 900 for how, um, how dark they are. 900 is a really dark version of that color. 50 is barely there. And so if I do something like 200, and I may have disabled the uh, add-in that should be, oh, I know why it's not working. We'll get Tailwind IntelliSense in a minute when we're using it not through the CDN. But we can see now we've made it a beautiful, color of baby throw up, right? And what we also want to do is go down here to the container, which used to um, be our container. And I'm going to say mx.auto, and that means make the margin, m, x for um, left and right at the same time. So you could do left, top, bottom, or just for all of them. I'm going to say auto, which is going to center this container on the page. And I'm going to set it to a different color. And this is showing it, but it doesn't really have a width to it yet. So we're going to actually add one more class that, depending on what you're doing, is I can make this a container class, which is going to make it the size, a responsive size, based on what the, what the device width is. So a lot of what we're looking at is just a couple of classes here or there. And let's do the last piece before we start to dig into how it works is I'm going to um, add a wrapper around the header, not delete the entire one, add a wrapper around the entire um, object there. And I'm going to add a new class here. And I'm going to say um, flex, right? And so depending on how you want to do the um, layout, what's interesting here is they've used the names that make sense to the actual names, but try to simplify some of the uh, complexities of it. So now we can see they're side by side because flex is automatically columns by default or one row, whichever way you want to think about it. And so we're starting to get at the beginning of this idea. So, Let's talk about, um, oh, let me make one more change, and that is to make our header a different color as well. Let's do what, 800? 
and I'm gonna add a padding P1 all around inside that container and text white, though I could have choose the color that another color like gray 50 if I wanted it not quite all white. And I was told you have to name the classes correctly for it to work. I was told. That's weird. I'm going to pretend that works. Oh, thank you. Have you ever done pair programming with 35 people in the room? It's lovely. By the way, you didn't catch that. That's your job. Do you remember? OK, good. So now we have our beautiful website. It's done, right? We've put three things. The problem is that we're still loading in this JavaScript, and it's trying to do runtime compilations. Not great. And so we'd like to move that to development time. So I'm going to open up a console here and just add it. I happen to be using um, uh, NPM already, so it's going to utilize that. But you don't have to actually have the NPM on the machine, I mean, uh, in your project to make it work. Uh, the first thing we're going to do, I always get this wrong, so I have a cheat sheet, is in it npx tailwind CSS and it. And this will go ahead and create your basic um, files that you need. And basically what it's done is it's created this tailwind config file. And this is something that's going to be used by tailwind to figure out how you want to build the project. And so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to tell it, hey, the content I want you to look at. Because part of what Tailwind is going to do is scan your files, HTML, template files, JavaScript files, for class names that Tailwind knows about to inject them into the CSS that it's going to use. And that's how it makes it so small. And so I'm just going to say source HTML and JavaScript. I'm also going to do the same for public in case I end up putting some things there as well. Now these contents are important because if you just put star dot star and include everything, it's going to try to find everything in your node modules folder. And if you have many plugins, it's going to make it take forever to work. So first thing is really defining where your content is and of course changing this at every at every um, point. And so let's whoops. Down here, I'll go ahead and create a new uh, CSS file. And I'm just calling it source so that I know that it's the beginning one. And in order for it to know how to build your CSS, it has to have a source file that just includes three pieces, tailwind, base, Tailwind components and tailwind utilities. So basically, it's allowing you to specify what order these parts of CS are, are injected, because order matters in here. And we'll actually, we'll see an example later, we can actually do layers to say, here's some CSS that you don't cover that I want to be in this part of the CSS. And that's all done in this, in this file pretty simply. So the last thing we need to do is actually tell it to uh, run it. And you can install this in your project, or you can just use another NPX. Just tailwind CSS. Import is source um, style. And output is going to be um, public styles.css or whatever we, you want to call it. So it took about 106 milliseconds to do this from our uh, original site. What do we get? We get this styles here that for some reason has nothing in it. Let's see if I messed up the config. Yep. That makes all the difference. Come on, Sean. You knew how to do this an hour ago. Oh, it took an extra three milliseconds. 
Really? What don't you like? No, oh yeah, I do. It's the little things. Had to do something, we ate up another 40. And so here we have our CSS file. Wow, that's a lot. Really, a lot of this is about reset. You can turn off reset if you want to, and this will become even smaller. But you can see the ones we've used, flex, um, white space wrap, just the two color uh, ambers we're using, all of those are being applied here. And if we just went ahead and did, and we could add this certainly to the NPM uh, scripts, whoops. We can also do the same thing and just say dash W, and it'll just watch in the background and make changes to the CSS we need. Make sense? So let's change our script here into CSS style that CSS. You can see that it did an incremental build of a whopping 18 milliseconds. Every time it sees one of these files that it's watching, any of these files change. Including, I think, thankfully, because so many, so many projects don't seem to do this, when you change the config, it will also rebuild, which uh, I don't know how many times I was doing a watch, I changed the config, and I was like, why isn't it working? Did I put it in, oh, styles. There we go. Oops. No, I don't want to learn about Edge. So we've got sort of our starting point here um, for running it. And now we can sort of continue to go through the styling of how this works and see some of the utility classes. Because really, once you've got the build working, it's just about utilizing these utility classes. So let's start there. I'm going to come down here to my main section. Whoops. The results, which really just have a collection of these film objects. And I'm going to start by just saying class grid grid calls. And you can see now we're getting the Tailwind IntelliSense because it's we're actually using Tailwind in our project with a config file. Um, there isn't a special add-in for this. The basic code in Visual Studio CSS um, IntelliSense work. I'm not sure in other editors, but certainly in those two it works. So I'm going to say three, and I'm going to say gap equals two. Gap is just the space in between the columns, right? We're getting there pretty close to wh what we had originally. Of course, it's all kind of ugly, and we'll sort of continue from there. But let me introduce you to one of the things that I really like about it is to actually say grid one, but LG grid calls two. There's five breakpoints in um, Tailwind. The, the smallest one doesn't have a modifier. So when I say uh, grid columns one, it's going to apply to every re, um, responsive page. And then there's small, medium, large, extra large, and 2x for different size of screens. By using this modifier on the class LG colon, it's saying at that breakpoint, change this property. This isn't unique to grids. This isn't across the entire project. These modifiers are a big part of what I like here. It allows me to keep the same nomenclature without having classes that are specific to each of those items, um, just having those breakpoints in there. And so unsurprisingly, unsurprisingly, it's not working at all. Grid calls two, just make sure I didn't mess something else up. Maybe I didn't save it. Yeah, grid columns two, as we go down, it'll be grid columns one. Yeah, everything you would expect from um, responsive layout. So all of that is really built in with these modifiers. And we're going to see some um, other modifiers here. We're going to see, um, let's actually do a couple more things. Let's say medium for two and large is grid calls four. And we'll see the same behavior. I probably don't need to show you every one, but it's funny to see that that's really the, the idea about what we're doing here is four, and then we get into the two, and then we get into the one. 
And you could do the same thing with hidden and changing font size, and all of that is going to continue to work so that you can think about the breakpoints as simply modifiers um, that you can stack on. So when you need more, it does mean that you're getting into this situation where your classes end up being really large. And this is the chief complaint around Tailwind for some people. They feel like it is um, making their HTML too busy. Uh, the perf ramifications I've been told are really small. I haven't really been able to do tests myself to see if 15 classes versus one meta class is that much faster. The speed of the uh, CSS being smaller, I think is gonna mitigate uh, any perf differences that are there. But we can um, sort of capture these and let's, let's talk about that next. Uh, so let's change these films real quick. So I'm just gonna give it a border, a rounded LG and that's a large size rounded that's not about the breakpoint because it would be LG colon if it was about the breakpoint. Say a gray of say 300. In fact, I'm going to make it semi-transparent by putting slash 50 for the class name. So being able to set transparency without having to think of it in a different way. There are only certain uh, tra um, uh, uh, trans, uh, what am I looking for? Transparent levels. I think there's 10, 25, 50, 75, 66, and 100 or something like that. But there's, you're not gonna be able to put 32 and have it magically work as far as I know. Frankly, I never tried. Why do I keep on hitting that one? Did I forget to save it again? Oh, because it's only on this first film. So in this case, I only have it on the first film and it's actually disappearing because this film is actually the placeholder, right? This is just the placeholder that's getting replaced at runtime when it calls the API. So instead of here, uh, by the way, the, this example isn't using any framework, it's all vanilla. That's not about that I think you should do it this way, but I didn't want anything else being sort of in the way of the, the topic we're talking about. So we come down to results.js where I've done a very clumsy template here for each of those films. These are being filled out by every result. I'll go ahead and add this here. Let's make sure I saved it. Oh, I haven't saved it. Say again. Oh, thank you so much. If I was any good, don't tell NDC that I'm this awkward. Really? Let's just make sure it's actually adding these. Why did I take my glasses off so I could see you guys? Yeah, it's still not putting them in there. What did I do? See if it's just a caching of my JS. Nope. Film. That is very strange. Oh, oh, I know why. Sorry about this. I'm using roll up, so I need to do uh, npm run. Dev. That way the um, CSS, the JavaScript gets recompiled for me. I forgot about that. Okay, I'm using one tool in the... Um, so we can see that and the border is really light. So let's just go ahead in here and say border, I'll say black just to be quick. So we can see how these are, are simply bordered and I haven't done a whole lot to like worry about exactly what they look like. And the last thing we'll do before we dig into some other things is let's go um, up to the container in index.js. By the way, the, you may have not been amazed by this, but I was the first time who was able to find these class names inside my JavaScript files and this would work. Angular, Vue, React, they all will look in those source files. Vue files are supported and JSX and TSX and all of that. But back here, let's go ahead and go to my 
object here, and I'm going to add a, a, a built-in style, though I could, use, I could always change this to a class if I want. But because I want to specify a, a background image, Come on, John. It is going to be image BG seats. And I'm going to add a class in here called cover. I'm sorry, back BG cover to tell it how I want it to lay out that background. And so now we can see that we're getting that background image here, and we're able to see through because of the transparency. Like we're getting a lot of what we want really out of the gate for the kind of the style we want. Make one more change just to make myself happy, which is text white. So it's a little more readable. Make sense? So let's talk about the header for a minute. One of the things that you may have noticed here in this header is that we have a drop down here. It has no styling whatsoever. It's, it's inheriting the white text I put in the, in, in the header here. And it's trying to do the right things with by picking the year you're you're looking at. And these are actually buttons, again, with no styling. Now, if you don't want to start from scratch, which is fine, you can go into the config and add a new piece that um, called core plugins. I used to know how to type. Don't get old people to do your talks. <laughs> um, so the way they've engineered Tailwind is this idea of plugins and core plugins. So you can extend it, or the core plugins are each of the pieces. And so you can actually say pre-flight, which is the um, resetting, the CSS reset. I can just say false. And in that case, if I go to the right window, we'll see that we now get those default but ugly Forms. And so you can see that you know, the mouse over for, um, all the uh, A's, all the anchors, are getting that horrible default look. And so we're going to have to do more. So I actually like to leave it in, but I'll just come to this out in case you ever download this demo. Who can really make these work? And let's start with the button. I keep on going to that page. So we have a class of button here. And I'm just going to style it by saying uh, padding one, so there's some room between it and the border. I'm going to go ahead and say border and border, uh, let's say yellow. Let me get a bit in the background, uh, amber. Whoops. And text white. Oh, though it's actually going to inherit with that. There we go. And that should all be there. Did I save it? Now that's annoying. Oh, that's the pager anyway. That's the pager that doesn't show up on the first page. So no wonder we can't see it. Sorry about that. So I'm going to go to this first menu. We can see here we have this a tad ugly, but it is a button that works now. But we want it to really feel like a button. And so let's make a couple more little changes. Let's go rounded, and um, let's do hover, BG color, I'm sorry, BG amber. Let's make it maybe 700 to make it get, and so now through CSS, I'm getting that behavior I want without having to really think about writing these on. on. You're not going to be able to... You still need to attach an event here, but the kind of uh, behavior that you want CSS to do is built in. You're going to see a number of these modifiers, and Hover is one that I use quite a lot. But we have an essential problem in that I just made it too small. 
Um, we have a central problem that this is going to be really annoying to copy to every button, right? This is the case where just using the classes might not be good enough. So I'm going to take that out, and I'm going to go back to our source, and I'm going to say in the layer components, I want to write some um, CSS that you're going to use. And I'm going to say, oh, I have a class called button, which we already have on all those items. It doesn't need to be a class. It could be a it could be inputs or uh, any CSS selector. And I'm going to say at apply that. What this is going to do is allow you, when you do need reuse, to take those same classes that you prototyped in the browser, throw them into an apply, and now you have a class that's going to uh, work. And you can see them now. They're all buttons, all four. Well, you can't see the fourth one, but all five buttons. But the one is being shown, are now applying that button. Now the one here gets black instead of white because we're inheriting it from that container, the color. So we could, of course, of course, put white in there. Let's make two more changes here. Go ahead and tell it to put a margin of one, just give us a little space around it, and width full. Right? Went out closer to what we wanted to do. And then we could, of course, come in here because we don't have a selected button dot selected, which is how I'm specifying which of the buttons have been pressed. I could just say add apply. Whoops. Either I'm too tall or this podium's too short. Uh, hover. No, on selected, say, um, I know I was going to forget the name of this class. I always do. Not hover, it is ring. Ring, which is a special kind of thing, and it says to envelop an object with another level of color around the border. And I'm going to say ring two, just to make it a bit thicker so it's obvious, and ring yellow. I'm going to choose a really bright yellow so you can see it. Oh, I don't need ring and ring two. Ring two is the thicker version of the ring. And so you notice here in the IntelliSense, it's actually giving us, you'll see this in the editor as well, it's giving us an error here because the error is that the same class property is affecting the same property itself, which is super useful for going, uh-oh, what did I just do? So as we change these, we can now see the selected changes with a little ring, right? And I'm doing this in code by adding the or removing the select selected uh, class. So it, it doesn't know about the actual functionality. It's just saying, oh, when it looks like when it's in this state, go ahead and do this certain thing. That makes sense? Let's do the same thing with the drop down. In the case of the drop down, since I'm only going to have one probably through my whole app, I might just do it in line, which is what I'll do here. So you could certainly make a class. And <clears throat> This is one of the places where uh, the person who created Tailwind and I differ. He thinks that you should almost never use apply, and I think you should use it where it makes sense. But what you shouldn't do, and I think in both of our opinions, is try to take all those classes and create special classes for them. It sort of breaks the idea of uh, simplicity in what you're doing and being very self-describing. So notice in the film, I used all the tags because there was code that was repeating that over and over. I could have just made it a film class and used apply, but I don't know that I would have gained much because I'm seeing what the style is when I'm editing that film block versus having to go look in the CSS to see what I need to change. But it's a personal opinion how much or little you use. I think his problem is um, most of the bugs he's fought in the last three months have been about apply. So he might be a little pained by apply, wish he never put it in or something, but it's too late. It's out there, right? So let's go to the select here. I'm going to do the same sort of thing. I'm going to say rounded, border, um, oh, just border, and uh, border color, whoops. 
uh, black and text. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Text white. Thank you. So we see this sort of working. Oh, it did make it white. It didn't make the background dark. I forgot to do one. To actually simplify this with text. Come on. And BG, uh, I'll use amber again. I'll put to 800, so it's nice and dark. So now we can see, and it's, you notice it's including based on the, the color what the drop down element is. And so let's make this a little bit more pretty and large like the other ones by just saying, say padding two with full. And we could obviously change the background color if we wanted to and even change the text size. So text size is an interesting one because um, what they have are these, you can see text base, extra small, small up to, I believe it's 5X. Yeah, so there's a wide range in these sort of levels. They don't want to prescriptively define what those are, but what uh, will happen in a lot of places, I'll go ahead and just use uh, text large here, just so it looks a little bit like, and I could even make it bold, but what will often happen in my projects is I will have a, inside the layer components, um, H1, apply text 3XL or something like that, and then do the same for all the H's to sort of rehydrate those at the levels we're talking about. And notice at no point in any of this are these classes specifying pixel size or RAMs or anything. The, the resulting CSS are in RAM so that it's gonna behave appropriately on resized screens and all of those sorts of things. But they're trying to build up uh, the comfort to um, have these sort of known sizings. So if we look at the, uh, I don't have the source open yet. We'll look at text large. You see they have these specific sizes associated with them, size and line height that it's using. And those, uh, those, the basis for all those are configurable. So if you don't like the large size being that size, you can make it up or down. Um, uh, just in the config file, there's ways to override that or even have themes for different cases. Like maybe you have a theme for one customer even though you're using a main site and that theme would have all these sort of overrides that are applicable just to them. So in many ways, unlike uh, a lot of the layout libraries out there, it's really meant for um, developers to uh, have uh, build time instances of Tailwind to give us the most flexibility without having to necessarily write a lot of the CSS. Now this doesn't preclude you writing CSS. I used apply there, but I could have certainly put in my own uh, classes and there's no conflict as long as they're not using the same name and you'll just run into the, um, the order problem. So one of the things that happens is some of the names in here actually exist in some of the other frameworks like, uh, like um, Bootstrap, and uh, as soon as I added Tailwind to it, instead of removing Bootstrap, I just added it in order to get some of the classes. Of course, I was conflicting, so every P1, which is a different size than the P1 in um, Tailwind, things were going crazy because we were fighting that who last in wins and uh, more specific CSS rules that you have to think about. And so let's... Uh, Let's do this in a more common way. Ooh. Steaming up my glasses. So over here in the source, let's do a tailwind base here. And I'm gonna create a new one that's called control base. Because a lot of what I'm doing here should probably be the same for a lot of the controls.
Why doesn't it like that? Oh, sorry. Base isn't uh, where we need to do this. It needs to be in components because a lot of those still doesn't like it. Did I forget to? What do you mean round it isn't? It's, it's right there. Must have done something different here. Come on, Sean. There we go. Um, I'm trying to use classes that aren't defined at the end of base. They're actually defined in the beginning of components, so that's why it was giving me that error, because um, it's sort of building these as we need them. And so we could then simply just replace all of this with, unsurprisingly, control base, right? So you can use this sort of hierarchy in the same way. And when you um, apply this, actually, let me see it applied to make sure I'm not lying to you. It's happened before that I made the assumption. Um, button. Come on, where's the button? I can go on. Oh, dot button. You can see the things that I applied to button aren't um, referring to the base CSS. They're actually apply as taking a, a mix of all the CSS that are defined in the other classes and putting in here, including your own base CSS classes as well. So you have that sort of um, uh, componentization of your UI without having to have the um, detriment of having to look up or whatever. It's, it's uh, putting out the most specific CSS it possibly can. And so we could apply that same thing here, though I'm not going to um, worry about a little, but let's go into the source again. Because one of the things I don't like is there's not quite enough space between either of these. So I'm going to tell my buttons, I could say uh, margin one, which obviously puts a little margin on the outside, but I, I don't want that. I could say margin Y, which gives it a top and a bottom of a little larger, but I can also do MX, I'm um, sorry, M left, M right. Let's see how much I've broken this bottom and top, right? You have control over which sort of levels you need to do that with. And let's undo this until I've unbroken it. There we go. So I'm just going to say MY1, just to make sure there's a little bit more space in here. And for some reason, I've made it a little too wide for my full width. And this is, the full width is changing. You still need to understand CSS a little because the full width is making the content of the button 100 wide, but I have a, 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 a padding on the left and right hand side, which is adding to that button size, or it might be a margin. You see what I did here? Yeah. So let's actually just put the padding Y here. And it still is a little large. I'd have to figure out why that is. My other demo it isn't there. And I'm sure it's something weird I'm doing. Um, but we can, you can see how building the CSS, one of the things I like here is I can really just spend my time editing and checking, editing, checking. But the thing that makes this harder is that if you're used to developing your CSS in the browser with the, with the editor window and just adding your properties and seeing how they go, it don't, doesn't know about those changes in the browser. And so if that's your pattern and you're comfortable with it, Tailwind might not be the right option for you. Because the reality uh, is that this is just another tool. I like it for a lot of the projects I do, but that doesn't mean it's the one true CSS god, right? If you're using SAS and you're getting everything you need, maybe this isn't the time to change. This is uh, one of those cases where for the right project and developer set, this is a great tool. I really like it. But uh, please don't come away from this talk as like, everyone should be moving to this, or everyone should be using, oh, he said Bootstrap. I'm going to have to take Bootstrap out of all my projects. The world doesn't work like that. And uh, 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 at the end, I think pragmatism is more important about these issues. Uh, I have a client who was like, I saw your Tailwind video. Do I need to put it in? I'm like, uh, no, please 
just no. You you got an ASPX. Um, I'm sorry, an ASP site full of other problems. Putting in Tailwind is not going to solve any of those, right? It's, it's the last thing you should be looking at. Um, ends up feeling you know better. Make sure I haven't uncovered any of these other. I did that. Oh, and I'm going to do just a couple more things just to make this a mostly workable site. So down here in the footer, you notice this footer is kind of ugly, right? Just left justified. And so I'll just do what I normally would do is just add, just make all the windows pop up at once, and then add um, text center, padding, let's say, 2. Uh, I'm not going to use margin, and I'm going to make it uh, another color, amber. Um, let's say 700 and text white. And so now our, it's a little nicer, right? It's kind of what you expect. You could have a lot more data in there, but for now, that's, that's perfectly good enough. Uh, oh, so here's an example of my 100% width on the buttons doesn't really work, right? And so this may be, oh, you know what? I just need to change the source to not have pull here and then to apply them only to the ones in my object. And I could do um, header dot button, or I could um, add it as well. I'm going to see if that works. I've never tried this. Instead of doing it, so I might have just broken it all. Yep. As long as I broke it, that's all that matters. Probably not called header. Oh, it's just called header. Okay, let's just fix it that way. Right. They have the same sort of behavior. And in some cases, let's go to all the passing films in 1977. We get this monstrosity, right? I really hate this. I don't want it to force um, the, I don't want to stick the footer to the bottom, but I do want to avoid the case where there's only a couple of names here. And so I'm just going to come back to index and I'm going to make the header, that you could do it to both of these. I'm just going to say, min height screen, right? And then no matter what the result is, like 1970 just had one result, the header is going to be there. You might want to do the same thing to make this larger as well, but the header is forcing that Bechtel test because I've told the header to be the width of the screen, not the width of the screen minus the size of the header. And none of this is about... Um, absolute positioning, but all of the things you think about in positioning and layout, flex, grid, uh, block, uh, inline, um, et cetera, they all have their own classes for you to do that sort of thing. And the last thing I'll mention, we don't, it's not really necessary here, but I love this. Let's say I'm having a problem with override and I know I'm not supposed to ever use um, important, but if I need to because I've screwed something up, you put an exclamation point in front of it, and it becomes important. And there's a few of those that are just sort of modifiers. In the same way, because this took me a little while to figure out, if I did want, let's say, a padding of 2, or let's say margin of 2, but I don't want a margin of 2, I want a margin of minus 2, that's the class, right? Margin dash minus 2 is a negative margin. Make sense? So we've got about 10 minutes for questions. Anything I didn't cover you wanted me to cover? Have any questions about how it works or why it works? I'm just going to start picking on people if no one has any questions. You don't, you don't believe me, do you? To the person who have, has used Tailwind before, did you see anything that you haven't learned before? Oh, good. Oh, great. Yeah. Awesome.
that's the right answer in case you don't know what color to pick out front if you're confused by the whole system. It defaults to green, so whatever you need to do. Well, if you're out of caffeine like I'm out of caffeine, we could end a little early if no one has questions, or if you're too shy, I'll stay up here for five minutes and answer any specific questions about this or anything you want to talk about. Anything else? If you um, don't have your own Uh, you can define the base of that color, and then it'll do the automatic uh, application um, of those colors as well. So defining your own color names or overriding existing names, as Norman was saying, something like amber base or um, uh, our corporate pink base, and then have it apply. The customization's pretty uh, deep. You can customize how it builds at a default level or create these things called themes, which are basically named uh, you would set the theme to on the top of a page that you could change, and then that theme would wholly take over for anything you that wasn't defined, uh, that was defined in that theme. So it gives you a lot of control. If you uh, dark and light theme are the probably the most common use of that, but they're just named themes, so it doesn't matter. Others, by the way, dark and light theme is turned off by default, but there's a booleans. I think it's called use dark that you put on and then all of those values change based on the theme of the system you're on. Um, it's doing that same detection of uh, Windows, Mac, and, and mobile for what color the theme is of the application. A lot of times, uh, most people don't want that automatic switch. They want to have more control, and so uh, that's why they have it off by default. But the docs are really good and clear. Um, the search is pretty good. Sometimes their descriptions of what is happening aren't tremendous, but if you know a little bit about CSS, you can get, because there is a, very much a one-to-one -one relationship between these class names and what they would be in CSS. They're not trying to hide them in some magic component name. Anyone else? Now that we've broken the seal, no? Well, uh, are any of you jet lagged? Wow, are you all local? No. Neither. Okay. I'm going to start by answering questions to the blank stairs. Thanks for, for coming. I'll put on my, my uh, um, slide with all the links. Uh, this demo will be up on willdemuth.com hopefully by the end of today, so you can grab it if you're interested. DelvinCSS.com is the website. I have a YouTube channel and a film I made about developers. So feel free to visit any and all of those. Thank you very much.